Hi hi, we are still getting more caught up with Boku no Hero Academia. The last one ended on a very intriguing cliffhanger uh, in this inconspicuous notebook uh, emblazoned with fight, as I'm sure many things around UA are. Uh, All Might has recorded every detail he could find about the previous quirk holders uh, that at one point held the powers of One for All. Which means that their quirks, Deku might have access to somewhere deep, deep within his heart. Um, Bakugao is here for some reason. He knows, of course, about the intricacies of this quirk. Um, and I guess it feels like maybe Midoriya needs some emotional support or something to get through this. Or maybe he needs like a sparring partner who can help him bring out these quirks. But he doesn't seem happy to be there. And I'm not surprised because he already said that Midoriya's quirk was kind of like unfair, a little broken, please nerf. Um, and finding out all the new ways in which it's even more powerful than they suspected. Uh, probably not feeling, making him feel good about his chances as number one hero. Anyways, couldn't find any leads on the second and third users. Given the era back then and the multifaceted nature of one for all, there's nothing about them in the records. I realize they harbored quirks, they might have left something behind themselves. But, hmm, it's, <clears throat> it's intriguing to think about the era back then, because both uh, One for All and All for One were born right at the start of Quirks, and have been carried forward either entirely just by uh, All for One, um, or by the succession of people carrying uh, One for All. But it means that uh, those first successors were right around the birthplace of Quirks when Things weren't very widely understood. There was just that magic golden baby, <laughs> and then everything got crazy. Um, the, the kind of infrastructure around it, the laws, the, the schools, the rules, everything was still very up in the air, I imagine. About Black Whip, I can only attain it for a second. Ronan Sero Aizawa Sensei's level. Pretty powerful support for technique. No contact yet. Fifth user was Lariat. He just starts flipping through it already. <laughs> He's not going to wait for Deku. Um, real name, Daigoro Banjo. Quirk, Black Whip. Because of the strings of energy he could shoot out, he was well suited for binding enemies and maneuvering in midair. Seems like a pretty cool guy. Seems like somebody maybe worthy of being uh, the successor. I don't think it was until All Might, though, that the uh, inheritor of uh, One for All was such a famous figure, was such a awe-inspiring figure. Sorry, I'm a little gassy. <clears throat> Before then, they were just heroes. They were just heroes that had the secrets of... Excuse me. This guy and the others didn't really have strong quirks. Never heard of these nobodies. <laughs> sure, they have awesome quirks. Just having a quirk is awesome to a loser like you. It's true, though. Deku thinks that pretty much every quirk is awesome. Um, and part of it is just his battle readiness, I think, that he's constantly thinking of the tactical applications uh, five or six levels deep of everything he encounters, but I genuinely think he just also thinks they're cool on a very personal level. Bakugo isn't wrong. All for One was obsessed with One for All. It was an age when evil wielded a degree of power that's hard for us to imagine nowadays. All for one went around crushing the strong because there was nobody who could defy his sheer malice and control. Writhing in that hellscape as they lay down to die, the past users made sure the power would reach the future. Hmm. So yeah, they're all defeated quite handedly. The only point at which they can start measuring up some sort of resistance is in the era of All Might. They weren't really chosen ones. Through all those battles... All they could do is receive the quirk and then entrust it to another. That's right. They all died young. Whose part is this dork gonna get mad at you doing your tangents? I kind of like this. Because there's like so much world building at play. And I feel like they're enticing us with this idea that in the future, any of these previous successors could have a really heart wrenching flashback. We could have just a flashback in general to the, the era of uh, All for One's dominion, his tyranny. Um, but if they give away too much now, if they talk about it to the extent that 
uh, Midoriya and All Might might want to, um, then it kind of gives it away. It, it spoils too much. Um, so it's it's best to just kind of create this uh, this dread, this this terror, this vague sense of things were bad, and then have the ability to expound on that later. And then you have Bakugo. That's the real reason he's here to keep things moving, so you don't get a chance to ruin the surprise. Float, my master's quirk. All right. Let's be real here. I'm a fan of this series. I've been a big fan of like all of the major developments. I think the way the story is moving is quite cool. I've liked pretty much all the arcs um, to greater or lesser extents, but generally quite a lot. I like all the characters. And I have a lot of confidence that for whatever story the author is willing to tell, things are gonna stay pretty good. I, I think he's earned my confidence in that regard. But we have to be wary. We can't just let things slide downhill before our eyes and not comment on them and not not try to find the warning signs, not try to uh, see exactly where the downfall of quality happens as it happens. You know, we owe it that much, this vigilance. Even if it, there's nothing we can do, even if all we can do is watch helplessly, at least we won't be delusional. At least we'll be fully aware of what's happening. Now, I'm not saying the series is getting worse right now, but there is this rule in Shonen. Um, I don't remember where I first heard about this, probably on A, uh, the 4chan board, but they were like quoting someone else, the poster. I'm not sure who originally said it or whose idea this was, but <laughs> that you can look at any Shonen series and the point at which it starts going just irredeemably unreversibly downhill is when the characters, the main characters, get to fly. <laughs> that for some reason, it's, it, I, think, I think it's not so much the flying. The flying itself doesn't really represent much. It's, or, or the flying itself doesn't really change things that much. It's, it's what it represents in terms of the writing, where the author um, is trying to just kind of give themselves outs to write an easier story. Well, they flew there. That's how they got there. They flew. What's going to happen in this scene? Well, they're flying around. That means I don't really have to draw a background. That means I really don't have to draw the characters in relation to each other. They're just flying. <laughs> um, it, it seems to be uh, some examples are like Dragon Ball Z. I mean, I think Dragon Ball Z certainly has its moments. Um, but the, the, the kind of masterpiece of Shonen Adventure that was OG Dragon Ball uh, Z, and basically everything after they start flying around, uh, really holds no candle to it. Bleach, another one, since the characters just kind of start flying willy-nilly. Uh, there's probably a lot more examples. Those are the only two that come to mind. Oh, uh, World of Warcraft, uh, a completely different medium and genre, um, but a lot of people say that uh, WoW lost a lot of its charm, a lot of its community, uh, when they introduced flying mounts. And here there's a very practical reason that once you start flying from place to place, you're going to be ignoring a lot more of the things in between. There's not going to be any kind of chance encounters between people happening to pass each other while traveling from city to city or anything like that. You just kind of go there. Um, it, it just, I don't know, it seems to represent some, some disconnect between the cast and the world that has been created for them. Um, I mean, it's telling that in One Piece, they never just start flying. Yeah, there's the the moonwalk thing, the, the CP9 technique, you kick the air and then you can hover and Sanji started doing it, but Luffy's never going to start doing it. You think he has time to learn how to fly? Oh, he did do the gum gum UFO though in, in uh, Punk Hazard, but he only did that once. Anyways, <laughs> flying, flying in Shonen. I don't know. Let me know. Is this a thing? Did I make this whole thing up? I'm pretty sure there's some quote about it that you can try to find for me because I'm lazy. Uh, where someone is like, you can note the, the point at which Shonen series go downhill by when they start flying. So, Deku's probably going to learn how to fly soon. And we all just got to get used to it. <sighs> all Might's Master, Nanashimura, Nexus for power. I win. I can already go airborne with my blasts. 
I'm gonna waste time learning a tool already in my kit. I'll be polishing my moves at our work study. That means I'm ahead of you. Q-E-D. <laughs> They're really misinterpreting this whole thing. Because it, it, it's a big difference. Being able to, to use, like, energy and, and kind of a technique, a battle technique in order to propel yourself. That's one thing. That's something that can show up in, like, battle and stuff, right? But just having free floating that you can just move around as easily as walking or easier but floating in, in full three-dimensional space. That's another matter entirely. They, they seem like they've completely lost the thread of this. Uh, no, you'll die. That's a very cute panel. Bakugou just sure that he's going to die. But uh, why is he here in the first place? That was never really explained. <laughs> just, just for... The, the, the sake of having it be a fun scene. I think in terms of character, I'm not sure if there would be a reason he'd want to show up. Well, I don't know. I guess he wants to stay abreast of uh, his rival's development. The house arrest boys are late again. No meat for you if you don't help us cook. What are they making? Looks like hot pot. I want hot pot. I try keeping the meat for me. See how that turns out for you. This is the contrast of the two. But Deku immediately runs off to help. Using his power, you can tell. He's got the lightning around him. Dish with a hodgepodge of ingredients. How lovely. Tea leaves? <laughs> oh no. Does she have no culinary sense? I like that uh, Aruka's hair. I keep saying her name wrong. I know it's Uru Urarakua or something. But I'm just going to say Aruka because it's easier. <laughs> the, the face shows up on the side of the head. Oh, that was fun. Domestic banter. Class B is coming by later too. Oh, that makes me really happy. She bring an extra sofa. That's awesome. They're going to have a little AB sleepover. That would be just as fun as the AB battle. It's a real strength of the series. All the characters are so personable. Um, the personalities and their battle strengths, you know, reflecting on each other in interesting ways. But it just makes it fun to watch them hang out. That's nice. Look, it's a big hot pot! Yeah! Work study brainstorm and hot pot party to fire us all up for the new term. How lovely. Everybody super excited. Fitting in all the members of Class 1A. I like it. Ida, of course, leading the festivities as class prize. Whoa, wait a minute. This That one hasn't been heated up yet. Is she... Whoa. Is she making them hallucinate another hot pot? By bending the light such that one appears... What? <laughs> what is she doing? What, what kind of prank is this? Maybe I don't understand it, but whatever. Let's form again will be second years. Wow. You get to greet new fusion. Whoa, I didn't even think about that. I didn't even think about that. There's going to be Hiro Kohai. That'll be very exciting. Hiro, of course, doesn't have clubs. You wouldn't interact with them much. Yeah, that's true. There hasn't been much cross-class cross interaction outside of the big three showing up and curb-stomping everybody. Um, but I'm sure we'll get to see some Kohai. That sounds like fun. <laughs> Minita with a truly deranged face. Does not want to think about studying. Uh, enough of that overly literal airhead shtick. I don't think that's a shtick. I think that's just Todoroki. And we all love him for it. Uh, during these exciting times, sometimes I find myself stopping to reflect. I'm really here at UA. I never imagined I'd have all night watching out for me. That the day would come when Kachan and I would have a normal-ish conversation. I am so blessed. <laughs> Toki, I mean, is uh, a little confused. But that's, I really like that scene. I really like that tiny moment of just sentimentality. It's not so much that it's ruining the, the pacing or the tone of the series. It's never so self-indulgent, but it really is nice. When you think of the entire scope of Deku's history, um, that he, he takes a second to reflect on, on how amazing it really is. 
It is pretty amazing. I love the feeling especially of like, I'm really here. That's one of my favorite feelings when I'm traveling and stuff that I'm, maybe I'm doing kind of like a more social activity or, or just something that I would normally do at home. Like I'm, I'm watching some TV in my, my hostel or capsule or whatever. And then I'm like, oh, right. I'm really in Tokyo. This is actually Tokyo. It's so cool. It's such a nice feeling. One of the, the true joys of traveling, I think. Yeah. Anyways, eraser head, checking in on all night. They had that scare with Airy. Something strange with his horn, her horn. I'm not sure what. I'm gonna start training her this week. Can help. What is it? Decided to keep on living. It's like, how do I put this? This feeling like I'm powerless keeps bubbling up inside of me. None of the students grow and learn. I end up frustrated that I can't do anything for them. It's torture. <laughs> yeah, basically. It, it is a, probably a very huge shock. This is really good, too. I'm, I'm so happy that they're taking the time to kind of uh, study our characters a little more, to really think about what, what would they be thinking in a situation like this? What, what does it really mean for them on a personal, emotional level, not just a plot level? And yeah, the, the fallout of All Might, um, losing his abilities, losing his status as the symbol of peace, that has tons and tons of plot implications that we're seeing in all sorts of ways, but it also has a lot of implications on him as a person. Oh, this is so nice. This is just such kind writing. Really caring about the characters. You know, what am I saying? Even if they all start flying, even if they all start flying tomorrow, what can make this series go downhill? You can live, you can be here. For a lot of people, that's all the push they need. So please just be the same brazen cocksure guy you are than you've always been. Oh, let's see to delay seeing stain. Oh, interesting. It's a character we haven't thought about too much lately, but one that could still hold a lot of sway in the series. Ooh, I love these panels of just the cherry blossoms blooming. Isn't that nice? What? March, end of the month, bad day, heroes vanished from the city. Whoa, 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 oh boy. Okay. Jeez, I thought we would get to the end of that chapter. Just on that note of sentimentality, just on this kind of nice exhaling. Huh. Everyone cares. All is right in the world, but no, another twist. So this is, of course, our, our Robotnik-looking evil doctor that creates the Nomus and is torturing Shimura. He's in, like, a normie-looking hospital, probably the one that Kurugiri is was trying to make reference to during that brief moment where his original personality broke through. And somehow, even though this doctor, you know, he seems powerful, it seems like he has a lot of access to amazing technologies and this army of Nomu at his disposal. But to do something like make heroes vanish from the city, what the hell does that mean? I don't know, but we can find out right away <laughs> because we're so far behind. We can probably get substantially into whatever this next arc is. There's so much stuff going on, you know? There's the whole meta liberation arc. There's stuff going on personally with Tomura. There's the mysteries of the Doctor and the Nomu and stuff. There's this whole Hawks double agent thing, Endeavor trying to become a better man and a better hero, the work terms, all of the normal school stuff, then all of the abnormal school stuff because they're moving into second year, holy crap. Um, the situation with Kurugiri, some new situation with Stain, all this sort of stuff that like, all of these, I often use this analogy of cards being held in the mangaka's hand that they can choose to play to advance the plot. And yet, instead of all of those, Top decked something insane. Heroes vanished from the city. What does that mean? Does it mean some heroes vanished? There was like an incident in which some pro heroes vanished? Does it mean that all heroes vanished? 
somehow conceptually heroes vanished? I don't know, but we're going to find out. You will definitely find out. So we'll see you then. Bye-bye.